Hello, everybody. Welcome to an all new edition of What Are Your Thoughts? I am here with Michael Batnick, as always. Michael, say hi to the folks. What's up, guys? We're going to have fun today. We're going to talk about all of the biggest topics on Wall Street, in finance, in the economy. We love that you're here with us. Play along in the comments below. Let's do it. All right, Mike, I am starting out and I want to talk about Warren Buffett because I was a little surprised at the third quarter 13F filing. Were you surprised at all? Um, at what in what 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 in particular? Scott, he's just like not, I you know the the you know the meme where like there's like something laying do on something the do something yeah. yeah do something with the stick so, like he sold Costco that was kind of surprising they sold Costco sold Apple um a little bit their banks keep selling the banks yep sold sold uh so he's selling down Wells Fargo it looks like to zero he rarely by the way he rarely th- trims he usually if he's selling he's selling. Uh, the Q2 airline sales, that might go down in, in the history books. Yeah. Not in a good way. Not in a good way. He in th- Or maybe in a good way. Maybe he got out ahead of these stocks being zeros. The airlines were in Q2. He sold $13 billion worth. And that's the most selling of stock he's done uh, in, in a, I think, in a decade, um, in, a, in a single quarter. But then last quarter, on net, pull out the buybacks, which I'll talk about in a minute, he still only bought 4.8 billion worth of of stock net, and that's with 150 billion dollars in cash. And it's and nothing. It's not like it's like a joke. Um, he did buy a few new names. He bought some Pfizer and some AbbVie, so a little bit of pharmaceutical. And you it, know, this is weird. Is he like trading now? Are they trading? I mean, this is not. This is this just Ted and Todd? It's hard to really separate what's going on exactly. Yeah, he's playing the coronavirus. He's. <laughs> Out of the airlines into into the the safety stocks. Who's their who's their prime broker? Robinhood. <laughs> um, let's talk about the buybacks because that's really what I wanted to get into. Um, so there wasn't a ton of activity in individual stocks. He did buy a midstream energy company for ten billion, and he did buy six billion worth of Japanese conglomerates. But his biggest purchase was Berkshire Hathaway stock. Uh, pretty much, he did not a uh, nine billion dollars worth of buybacks in Q three. That takes his total for the year, fifteen billion worth of Berkshire Hathaway stock, and somebody at the Journal pulled out a who did this, Jenna Teleska pulled out a quote from two thousand seventeen, where he was like, "There's no way I can come back three for, three years from now and tell you that we hold one hundred and fifty billion or so in cash, and we think we're doing something brilliant by doing it." So still at one hundred fifty billion in cash. What would you do if you were him? No, seriously. What would you do? Hundred and fifty billion in cash, earning nothing. What would you do with the money? What about a one-time special dividend? What about a regular dividend? They've never done it. Do you hate that idea? No. This is a good quote from uh, from Lawrence Cunningham, who's collected the letters. It's a very helpful positive for a post Buffett Berkshire. You're going to maintain the quality of the shareholder base. By, that's what he, on buying back stock. So what he means is every share that Berkshire buys in the open market. They're buying it from someone that they don't want as a shareholder. Like it, it's better off if the company just kills that stock, brings it back into the treasury and not have that that selling shareholder. I understand that because I read Cunningham's book about the CEOs who really want to have control over who owns their stock and how they message them. Um, I don't know if I really buy that 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 argument that it's so great, but they should be doing buybacks because if you don't have anything else to do, don't just sit there with 150 billion in cash. Um, Brooklyn investor did a post uh, a few years back that this giant cash pie that everybody's talking about is really just growing in line with the potential liabilities they have on the insurance side. So it's yeah. not it's not necessarily as big as it looks, even if it's a giant number. All right, let's move on. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you: if they announced, all right, so with 150 billion on a 540 billion dollar market cap, essentially they're like 26 percent of the market cap is is cash. If they announced a 5% dividend like tomorrow, I know they're not going to, but if they just said, we're going to pay out $25 billion a year and pay a 5% dividend, what would the stock price do? That, I mean, it would, it would gap because then there's ETFs buying. There's it's a whole new shareholder base. And I don't think they want that. So that's why I was going for a, a special dividend. Right. All right. Um, I thought this was a great tweet. 
What was your worst experience while on a job interview? I can only really answer in terms of like giving a job interview. Because you haven't really been on too many job interviews. No, I'm a boss, a certified boss. I would no. I look. I've been cringe. on cringe. <laughs> kidding. Um, I I worked for guys before where there was no interview necessary. Uh, when I first started my first job in as a stockbroker, like as a meaning they just hired anybody like you to hire yeah, anybody. Go. Yeah, like a cold caller. I got a job. My first job was working for this guy. Um, I was like 19, in between freshman and sophomore year at college, and. The guy's dad played golf with my dad and there was no interview. I just like started work and the guy goes, the guy goes, you're Larry's son. I'm like, yeah, he goes, all right, nice to meet you. There's your desk. I'll see you. I'll see you on Friday. And <laughs> it was like, a, it was like, do you ever read, um, you ever read David Copperfield? Are you familiar yeah. at all with? So all, magician? all these orphan boys on the street basically end up stealing, le- learning how to steal for uh, Fagan. So they pick in pockets on the streets of London and then they all report back at the end of the day. Like that was what I was in a cold calling bullpen with a hundred people. I don't know why we're even talking about this. Um, what, <laughs> Michael, what was your experience? Uh, worst experience on a job interview? Um, I have I have a few bad ones. So in like 2011, maybe I somehow got an interview. It wasn't even an interview. It was sort of like a meeting. This guy working, a managing director at Natixis, I had like some sort of secondhand connection with him and he wanted me to pitch him five stocks. Natixis is like the mutual fund company. He, like a giant French asset manager. And he wanted you to pitch him? Yeah. <laughs> what did you pitch him? <laughs> what did you pitch him? You were probably pitching him shorts. I know you were. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. I, I wish, God, I wish I could remember what the thesis here was, but- <laughs> I had five stocks. One of them, I came in and I I, I pitched Vale, and he goes, Vale, Vale, oh, f- and I was like, Wait, all right, I'm a I'm a moron, and this guy just gave me douche chills, but that worked out really well because uh, that was 2011. Wait, the that minings, thing- the mining stock Vale, you went in and said, I, uh, and you went in and pitched him Vale. Yeah, uh, I have no fi- idea. You're fired. I have, dude, it fell 95 percent. Not to be outdone, I also pitched. I would have BHP. hired you just to fire you. I also pitched BHP, which also fell about ninety percent. And I think I think I must have done this because emerging markets were hot in like twenty ten. So BHP was like the Australian valet, the giant Australian mining yeah. company. Yeah. And I do remember this vividly because I said this as a joke. I remember saying this as a joke because we laughed about it. Um, I gave whatever my thesis was, and I said, "Plus, they're doing the medals for the Olympics next year, so that should be good." <laughs> I would have said, "Badik." Step into my office because you're fucking fired. <laughs> anyway, I did not get the job. Those stocks could not have fallen more. Like you, I don't know that there was a job, but I didn't get it. Yeah, congrats. I think things worked out okay. Um, all right, we got to move on. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to get into how I invest my money. Um, today, today is launch day, and I actually have a question connected to this. Did you buy a copy yet? I haven't heard anything from you. Of course I did. You did? What do you mean? I pre-ordered it like as soon as the first time you put a link out. Is it wrong that I didn't just hand you one? I told it slipped my mind. I wasn't even thinking about it. You know what's funny? Last week I was like, why didn't he just give me a copy? I don't know. Or no. And then I was like, why didn't I just grab one from you? Right. I don't know. Like it didn't occur to me. And I didn't give a copy to Barry. What am I doing? I'm just going to get it like a civilian. But if it does come today, is it going to come today? I'm, I'm. I'm very excited. Genuinely, I'm very excited to read it. You're gonna you're gonna go through it fast because each chapter is like four pages, which is yeah, we did I that by wait. design. So you, this is your kind of book because you don't have to dwell on any one thing for too long. I think you'll like yeah, it. Yeah, I can't wait. Um, oh, let me ask you a question. Wait, yeah. was there another question? Or was that it? No, I just it, it occurred to me this morning that I didn't get a book to you, <laughs> Ben, Barry. I'm sending copies of this book out to guys with syndicated radio shows that have eight listeners. And I didn't which, give you a book. <laughs> which chapter do you think I'm going to be surprised by the most or enjoy the most? Like, which one do you think I'm going to read and be like, wow, that was really interesting? I don't know if you'll be surprised, but I think the biggest impact on you will probably be um, Desarte's chapter um, and Saidi's chapter. Saidi's, like, goes in. And, you know, like... Like we, when we sent these invitations out, we didn't know who was going to like really 
get personal and like tell the real story. And like everyone did, like everyone was like their unvarnished self. I'm did not you do a chapter. I did a chapter, but like my chapter was the original blog post. Right. So I just updated it and I did it. I did an intro, but we got like, people were like themselves and they were like, look, here's the, the real that story. The point, right. That, That's the point. That was the point. And, um, I loved the chapter that I liked the best. I, I think is C Wright's chapter. Just because Bob, like I know Bob for, you know, eight years or whatever. It's just so Bob. And, you know, he didn't submit 7,000 words to us or 10,000 words, which his amazing blog posts are that long. He like stuck with the format and said so much in so few words. It was really powerful. Anyway, I like Well, I can't, I like can't wait all. to read it. Congratulations. Thank you, my man. I appreciate it. Okay, I wanted to talk to you, ask you some thoughts about the TD Schwab merger, which is here and it's really getting real. So TD Ameritrade had 260 branches. Yeah. 205 of them, which is 80% of all branches, have been scrapped. Yeah. Uh, branch count at the two firms are down by approximately 34%. So Schwab's now got 400 physical locations. 140 of them are shared with TD. And each of those shared locations are going to have both firm brandings, which should be interesting. It's going to say like, there's going to be both signs. Yo, that's, um, that's like when you, that's like when you go to pizza hut and they have KFC in there. I'm okay with that. Um, so one other thing that, Oh, you don't go, Oh, you don't go to pizza hut. You too good. You too good for that. What? Never don't mind. put, don't, don't put slices in my mouth. I never said that. Or you go to, uh, what's the thing that also has Baskin Robbins always? Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, Dunkin'. Yeah, yeah. All right, so they're going to have joint locations. That makes no sense to me, but okay. What else? Why not? Why does it make what's no sense? What's the point? Why would anyone need that? Is it just like... They're, they're cutting costs. They're Yeah. Um, I, you know who I got a text from this week? Remember uh, Neil Curran? Yes. Neil? Is he still there? No, he got merged out, but he probably knew he would. But he's like... First of all, Neil's the man. Neil is the well, guy. He was super. He was super senior, and he had a really long career. So I'm not surprised that he's amazing career. Neil is the guy that put us in business. For those for for those who don't really know how it works, RIAs working with custodians. Neil was our rep at TD Ameritrade when Barry and I told him we wanted to build our own firm. He was like, "I got you. Anything you need. Love you guys. The, uh, TD wants to bet on you." And they totally did, and Neil delivered. So he's uh, he's uh, in Florida, and there's a million, you know, um, there's a million RIAs and et cetera in Florida. So he'll he'll be super successful no matter what. So here's my question: Is this going to be a watershed moment for our industry? In five years, we'll look back and say this was the 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 beginning of the end or whatever. Be- um, beginning of the end of what? That's not what I'm. That's not what I'm. I don't mean the, the end of anything. I just mean. I just mean, this was it. Will this be a watershed moment, or will it be business as usual? No, I think it is a watershed moment. I think you're making a good point. Um, and the, but what makes it a watershed moment is that the stakes are going to go up for everyone in our business, because I think that TD was a little bit more, let's say, generous toward um, smaller RIAs and accommodative. Accommodative is right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. I don't want to upset anybody. There's this whole cottage industry of um, like motivation people and consultants who like the whole thing is like anyone can just be an RIA. And it has been that way for a while. But I think with less choice on the custody side, it's going to be harder to just be a solo person, do everything yourself and get services from somewhere like TD, Schwab, Pershing, Fidelity, they're going to want more in exchange um, for providing these services because they're competing with less firms. Like this is So then there's opportunity for companies like Altruist and other young, younger custodians to step in and fill the void. Absolutely. I don't, I don't think that it closes all the doors to a smaller advisor. I just think the stakes are going up to be a, a practitioner with your own firm in our industry. And it's not just because of this. But I do think that there's going to be a lot more benefit of scale now than there was yesterday. And that's natural. That's every industry. Um, but I don't think it's necessarily a negative. I'm trying to I'm trying to look at it as a positive. You know, I guess we'll, we'll all find out the same way, right? We, we, we don't really know everything that it's going to mean. We all have opinions. And probably the most aggressively negative opinions don't come true. 
it's just been, been my experience uh, about things in general. I want to get into Moore's Law because I read the same article you read in Barron's about how Moore's Law is reaching its limit of, of how small and powerful semiconductors can be made and that this is having some sort of a throttling effect on the economy. I totally don't get it. And Matthew Klein is really smart, uh, the, the author. And the, the article made absolutely no sense. It seemed like he was trying really hard to draw a parallel between computing power and economic growth that just really isn't there. But All right, so I, I bought it hook, line, and sinker. Maybe you're a more critical reader. Why did you not think what, – what did you not buy about it? I, I just I, – I don't think – I don't think that there's any linear relationship between economic growth and how powerful technology is, um, like in terms of like, like chip power. I just I, – I can't see it. And just because we're not shrinking those transistors anymore – and maybe they ta- they cap out at five nanometers or whatever it is. Like forget- they're like the size of blood cells now. They're like tiny, tiny, tiny. But they've been. I don't. First of all, the the emergence of Nvidia uh, as a as a power in semiconductors um, has to do with the architecture of the chip. It's not just how small we can shrink everything and how little heat the chips generate. It's it's. They they figured out what works for video games works really well for a host of applications in machine learning, AI, um, and they're doing this kind of distributed processing as opposed to linear. So the chip can carry out multiple uh, operations at once side by side rather than everything all in a row. And that's been a massive breakthrough. And it's not necessarily about how small you can shrink the chip. Um, so I, I just I don't buy it. And then I'm a shareholder in Google, and I'm reading about what they're doing in quantum computing and I, what IBM is doing in quantum computing. And I don't think the end of the semiconductor Moore's Law, like even if they could never go further, I just don't see why that would hold back a whole economy. I don't know. What, what was your take on it? Um, like I said, I, I didn't really go that deep. I just saw this chart and I was like, oh, pretty chart. But now listening to you, I think that you're I – think, I think that maybe – so in the tech boom, the increased supply of computers and software and innovation within computer manufacturing was, was responsible for more than half of the growth of the economy. Right. But maybe that, was a one, maybe that was a one-time thing. And so we're saying that just because we grew quickly then, we need that in place. So it's sort of a correlation causation thing. Um, oh, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know enough about this. W- one other thing. Did you f***ing put a, a hyphen in the middle of the word semiconductor on your blog? Hold on. I don't. I don't think so. No, nah, I? I think you did. What are you doing? What's going on with you? You know, if okay, you know what that's from. You are very observant. Yeah, I just. You're not allowed to do. I just. You're not allowed to do that. Well, let me tell you. Okay. Th- so this is this is the this is the downside of technology. I just started using Grammarly. Okay. And that must have been like an autocorrect. What is Grammarly? Is it a word processor? So there was so there was a sentence that I was trying to figure out. I'm not a good writer like you are. So I started off a blog post and I was like, this doesn't make any sense. What am I trying to say? So it was a, it was a grammar rule that I was looking up. So I literally wrote the word blah, 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 blah. I wrote the sentence and I wrote rule. And so it took me to Grammarly, which is a bot that basically fixes your grammar. Yeah. And I've been I've I've used it for two or three posts so far, and I love it. But the downside is, I guess, it, it gives me hyphens for semiconductor. Okay, so Grammarly needs to then consult Spellerly and, <laughs> and, and fix its own life. Okay, what do you got? All right, I want to talk about fun flows. Yeah. And my general thoughts are that this is – I love watching flows. I love reading about sentiment. I don't think it's particularly useful – as far as I feel like so much, so much money has been lost trying to time the market based on flows and sentiment and anecdote and things like that. And sentiment trader, you know, I quote him all the time. I think he does amazing work here. Um, so last week, uh, there was nearly forty-five billion dollars in net inflows. Record uh, is that a re- Amer- is that a record? According to Bank of America, that's an that's an all-time record. Um, AAII, the bulls and bears, they do that survey. I think it's uh, every month. Jumped the bulls jumped from 38 to 55 percent, which is the highest since January 2018. Uh, here's another really good chart from Arbor Data Science the rolling weekly ETF flows, the spread between equities and safety, like treasuries and low vol stocks, 
um, is at is at the highest level it's it's been since two, early 2017. And then uh, there's more charts from Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey showing um, just spikes all over the place, small into large. People are leaving cash in staples and bonds, and and everybody's back in the pool. Every, well, I said it on the blog two weeks ago, a week before the election and the vaccine were announced, and I said the vaccine is a deus ex machina. Like, it's one of these things where everyone's like— By the way, you've said that. Nobody knows what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. I've heard you say that five times. I still don't know what you're talking about. The deus ex machina is a, a device that the playwrights uh, nobody in, cares. In, in ancient Greece used to use. Well, it's how— Here's why everyone should care, because it's very rare that you get something where the minute it happens, it resolves all, yeah, all, all yeah. the problems. And that's literally what happened. This thing, uh, F- the Pfizer news immediately triggered $45 billion rushing into stock funds. I think it's hard to deny that it was a deus ex machina. It was literally God from the machine. Um, and now we have another vaccine that looks like it'll also get approved with an even higher efficacy rate and two more Johnson and Johnson's and AstraZeneca's sometime before the end of this year, perhaps you will have four vaccines that have a very good shot at emergency use authorization. All, all four companies are ready and willing to provide billions of doses in calendar 2021. That is what you saw in the sentiment data and in the fund flows data. And it was very easy to predict in advance. It's one of the few things that I think most people knew would happen, and it did. Do you think a lot of people will be quick to like try and fade this? I be do. My, be my guest. They should. If that's the, if that's the game they want to play, they should. I think from an investing standpoint, if you hate uncertainty, you have a lot less uncertainty this week than you had last week. All right, Duncan. Hey, hey guys. We've got some good questions today. Uh, the first question comes from Charles, and it's for you, Josh. Charles asks, should I look at trimming my winners after they climb a certain percentage or when they get to be larger than a certain percentage of my overall portfolio? That it, so that it's not a it's not a bad topic, but it's just the opposite of the way I think. Like nothing would make me happier to hold a stock forever. And I recognize that's not realistic and most stocks don't continue to work forever, but if you find the ones that do, like the apples, they make up for so many other stupid trades or investments you've made that they're worth it. So I don't think that way. I rarely go into um, an individual stock investment with like a sell target. I also think want to sell is like the most unanswerable question in all of like stock picking, trading. I mean, yeah. there's no answer. The, the, well, there's there's no right answer, but- um, I mean, the answer is you sell at the top, duh. Yeah, no, I but I think trimming, if you have a huge winner, like I sold a little bit of NVIDIA and Apple this year. NVIDIA was up 800% from where I bought it. Like, how do you not how do you not sell a little bit? The problem is you could make the same argument when it's up four hundred percent, and so it's. I don't really think that there is like a a science, but I think if you look at it in context of your overall portfolio, and you just say, as great as this company is, it's too big relative to everything else I own. Maybe that's the the right way to think about selling from my perspective, but it doesn't mean it'll be right for you. Okay. And so then for you, Michael, Rick from Canada writes, companies like CrowdStrike and Amazon have traditionally high valuations. What are your thoughts on valuing high growth businesses and what metrics are you looking at to make investment decisions? Yeah, this is hard. Um, I I guess I'll answer the question and then I'll give the non-answer, which I think is more important. In terms of the metrics that you want to look at, you growth. Growth is all that matter. You want to see margins continuing to expand. You want to see revenue going up. I think for a lot of those high valuation companies, you don't necessarily necessarily care about the bottom users, line. Users, users, users. Um, sure, but here's what here's what I would th- say is more important than any of that. The best invest, the best growth investors often have qualitative insights that other people necessarily don't. So I think that they have to know the industry, the business, uh, the landscape. All of that is so much more important than quantitative data, in my opinion. I think that was the answer on Tesla. The, the qualitative data, the, the qualitative information about what was so stagnant about all the competitors was a better insight than the valuation Tesla was trading at relative to its peers. Like, Speaking of which, I'm glad, I'm, I, I, I meant to give you kudos. I, I almost forgot. General Motors, I'm pretty sure I saw some people dumping on you in the comment section after, after talking about that stock. It's on fire. On fire. So kudos to you. What, well, did we just did we just jinx it? Is it done now? 
Where, where's it opening today? Let's Maybe. Um, <laughs> it's on fire. Stock looks great. Now Congratulations. Is, is this a vaccine stock or a non-vaccine stock? I can't no, decide. Non-vaccine stock. Not non a vaccine stock. stock. Uh, General Motors all time high post coming back public from bankruptcy was in late 2017. I think it was 45 or 46. And it's making, it's making a run. It's it looks like it wants to challenge that level. It could get turned away. Um, I I put out a text to to my followers that I was buying it uh, at the at the time that I was buying it. And uh, it's kind of interesting to hear feedback that way, too. Like people were texting back. Good luck with that, blah blah blah, and then some. Because they think they th when you think General Motors, you don't think of what you're, you don't think of the tech stuff that's going on. Mike, do you know how f Apple was in 1997? Do you have any idea how fucked? No, I was 12. Literally, they reinvented the company with those candy shell colored desktop eggs. They had that. They had that in middle school. I remember that. Right. Well, that's so. That's 90. Sorry, 96. 97, you start seeing those popping up in college dorm rooms. I remember visiting my wife at University of Michigan. She had one of those in her room. I'm like, that's the ugliest computer I've ever seen. That stock was like $10 at the time. This is pre-iPod. So I'm not saying GM is reinventing Wait, what does this it's, have to do with anything? I'm not saying GM is going to become Apple. I'm just saying like not every company that looks like it's dead in the water uh, ends up that way. All right. Uh, mo just, just, just most of them. Just most. All right. But we want to hear from you guys. What are your thoughts on the topics we discussed? We really appreciate you contributing topics. So if you want to do that next week, go ahead and send us an email. Uh, ask the compound show at Gmail. Remember, look for my book today on Amazon. Really appreciate everybody who, uh, who is supporting the book, buying the book, pre-ordering the book. Today it went live. So I hope you can get your copy, and I'll have details about how we're, I'm going to sign those copies later this week, so stay tuned. We will see you again next week. Thanks again for coming out.